So I made a resolution that I wouldn't get overexcited about book prize lists this year, but <laughs> Hi everyone, how are you doing? I am Eric from the book blog Lonesome Reader, and I'm here at Booker Prize HQ because the long list for the Booker International has just been announced. And uh, so I have uh, all of the books here from the list. These aren't all of them, but there's quite a lot of them. So I don't know if I'm strong enough to hold them all up, but, uh, but I wanna chat through the list because there's lots of really intriguing books on it. So I'll go through it all and give summaries of all the books and some thoughts and information around them uh, to give you hopefully an idea of books that you might be interested in reading and the ones that I want to get to reading uh, before the shortlist is announced in April. But I also want to have a little overview of the prize first, uh, talking about all of the, the books on it. So looking at this list, if you want to look at statistics, uh, it is a female dominant list of uh, female authors. So there are seven uh, female authors, there are five male authors, and there is one author that identifies as non-binary. Uh, at least I believe that's the, the case in the, the uh, the author description of their book. Uh, they use the pronouns they and them. And I know one of the comments a lot of people are going to make about this list just looking at it from the outside is that it is, again, a very European dominated list. There are seven books from the list that are from European countries, although there is uh, The Eighth Life, which is uh, from Georgia, which I think technically that country uh, is sort of classified as being in Europe, but of course culturally and socially, uh, the people of Georgia identify much more with European culture and uh, and the, the author of this novel, uh, I believe now lives in Germany and writes in German. So, you know, it's basically a German author. And, and uh, so, yeah, and the, the, the rest of the books on the list, the, the other uh, six novels come from uh, countries all around the world, fairly evenly spread. There's a couple from South America, one from North America, one from Africa, uh, one from Asia, and one from the Middle East. And I know the, there'll be a, sort of this criticism of, of that it's, it's, the list leans more towards European novels. And I'm not really sure why that, that is. I mean, the UK is in Europe, so I mean, I guess I, more books uh, from European countries that get translated tend to get published in the UK than from the, the rest of the world. Um, but I know some people will have say like, oh, why can't we have a year where it's more uh, sort of Asian um, countries are represented or South American countries. And, and I sort of get that criticism. But I wonder too, if maybe the judges are sort of making a slight point this year, since this is the year uh, that Great Britain has left, is officially leaving the European Union uh, to pick uh, books from European countries as a way of saying that we're still culturally connected to, to these different countries. Um, that's just my idea of, of why they, they might have chosen more of these. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is more about the content of the books themselves. And I'm sure the judges were fairly objective about just wanting to pick the, the very best, best books from the 124 novels that were submitted for the prize. So they just picked 13 from all of those books. And one of the reasons I was especially excited about this year's uh, long list for the International Prize is that there's a really great group of judges. Uh, so some of the judges include Jennifer Croft, who is a, a translator and was a translator from one of the former uh, international winners of Flights by Olga Tukorczyk. And uh, also on the list uh, of the group of judges is Valeria Luiselli, uh, who's a brilliant writer, very important writer, um, whose most recent novel is Lost Children Archive, which has been nominated for multiple awards, including including the, the main Booker Prize last year and the, the Women's Prize. And just a few days ago, it was uh, shortlisted for the Rathbones Folio Prize uh, for this year. Um, so that's really exciting. And then also uh, chairing the, the group of judges is uh, Ted Hodgkinson, um, who is head of literature at the South Bank Center, which is one of my favorite venues to go to for cultural events in, in London. And uh, I know he's a really passionate reader and, uh, and it always takes special care to bring international authors to the South Bank Center to have conversations and discussions. Um, so it's a really great, you know, smart group of judges who I trust, you know, that they're really readers first, because honestly, with some book prizes, I know 
that they go more for kind of the celebrity judges um, who might not necessarily, you know, reading might not necessarily be the thing that they do first. Um, but with all these judges, I know that, you know, they're very passionate, committed readers. And so, you know, they're going to be very judicious about which books and only choosing the very best books. So, you know, that is one of the reasons I'm really um, excited about this year's prize. Um, and just very quickly before I go into talking about all the books, um, it should be noted too that two of the novels haven't actually been published yet. I know this is always an issue for people looking that want to follow the prize and read all the books on the list. Um, so The Discomfort of Evening, I believe, is due to be published around mid-March. And um, Samantha Schwublin's Little Eyes is due to be published in mid-April, um, which is will actually be after the shortlist announcement, which is on April 2nd. Um, so, so that might be an issue for some people, though with last year, um, there were two books that hadn't been published when the long list was announced. And so the publishers rushed the publication and brought them out beforehand. So that could very well happen again this year. Um, we, we don't really know yet, uh, but I'll post, uh, I'll pin a comment in the um, the comments below this video. If it turns out the, the publishers do bring the publication date forward, um, then you, you know that um, you'll know that you can get them uh, beforehand before the the shortlist announced if you are really interested in reading these these two books. So okay, I'm going to go through and, and discuss all, all the, the novels now, the 13 novels, and give my thoughts about them. And I will go in alphabetical order uh, by author surname. The first novel is from South Africa. It's Red Dog by William Enker. It's translated by Mikael Haynes. And it was uh, first written in Afrikaans, uh, but was only just translated into English and published in English language countries within the past year, uh, which is why it's eligible. And it's looking at the colonial history of uh, South Africa, the changing colonial history uh, from Dutch to French to English. And it's looking at this story. Um, it's set in the 18th century um, and focuses on one larger than life man and his really epic story, uh, very filled with lots of very violent scenes. I, I've been uh, given the indication that there's lots of violent scenes. Uh, in this novel because obviously South Africa's history has been very bloody and, and violent as you know there's been changing rule um, and it's sort of meant to be a part a novel and a part historical account looking at that, that period of history. Next is a novel from Iran and that's The Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree by Shakufe Azar and uh, I know we always say name the translator um, but actually the translator for this novel uh, wanted to be listed as anonymous. Um, I don't know if the translator still lives in Iran and is slightly nervous about being public about translating this novel, but, um, but yeah, the, the translator is just listed as anonymous. And the, the author actually moved uh, to Australia in 2011 um, as a political refugee, um, so now lives in Australia. And, uh, and so this novel um, is set in Iran um, after the 1979 Islamic Revolution and follows the, the story of a 13-year-old girl. It's narrated from her perspective and she's actually a ghost. So that sounds like a very intriguing um, point of view to, to take on the country. And also I should say this novel was previously um, shortlisted for the Stella Prize uh, for Fiction, um, which is a Australian prize um, which, which honors uh, female writers uh, in Australia. Um, so I don't know if Jacqueline has read this or not. I, I haven't um, noticed, but um, she, she's a booktuber that follows uh, the Stella Prize pretty closely. From Argentina, The Adventures of China Iron, and it is supposed to be pronounced China. Uh, so this was written by Gabriela Cabazon Camara and was translated by two translators, uh, Fiona McIntosh and Iona McIntyre. Uh, so they, I have to explain about the title of this novel. So China is another word for female, and then iron is the English word uh, for fiero, which is a reference to the gaucho Martin Fiero. Uh, the main subject of an epic Argentinian poem from the 1800s, uh, which is meant to look at sort of Argentinian history and the, the formation of modern day Argentina. Um, so this is uh, looking at the, the adventures and journeys and travels of uh, Martin Fierro's wife, um, who he abandoned, and who is journeying across the country with a Scottish woman who becomes her lover. And um, they're sort of looking for a place 
place of sanctuary and safety. Um, it's actually described by the publisher as a sort of romp of a story. It's meant to be very funny, so I'm very intrigued to read this novel. From Norway, there is the other name, Septology 1-2 by John Fossey, and it's translated by Damien Searles. Uh, so this novel is, uh, it's about a man named Eil, who uh, lives in a very remote location. He's uh, in his 60s, he's a painter and a widower, and, uh, and he lives a fairly reclusive life, but he discovers there's another man also named Eil who lives in a city and is also a painter and his his doppelganger and so it's looking at these two different lives and two different um, ways of looking at loneliness it's meant to be a very existential novel sort of looking at big questions to do with life and death and faith and meaning uh, so you sort of know what you're getting I mean the the author himself says you don't read my novels for the plot um, so that gives you an indication of sort of what to expect with this novel but this is an author that's won every major award in literary award in Norway um, I think and uh, and is his writing's been compared uh, to Samuel Beckett and Ibsen so I'm, I'm quite curious about this novel next is a novel I already mentioned is from Georgia. Uh, that's The Eighth Life by Nina Haratachvili. Um, it's translated by Charlotte Collins and Ruth Martin. And I've already talked about this novel quite a lot on my channel in previous videos because it's one I started reading uh, last September and was really excited about, but it is such a long novel. So uh, in, as I do with some big books, I try to read other books while also reading it. And I know that's sort of a mistake because after about 200 pages of reading this, I started reading another novel and thought I'll go back to this soon but then I just didn't go back to it and it wasn't because I wasn't enjoying the story because it's a really good uh, engaging story but yeah I just allowed myself to get distracted which I know is a mistake and I know I feel guilty about but now I have a good reason to go back and read it with earnest and finally finish reading it. So it looks at, um, the story is about uh, the past century of uh, the country of Georgia and the really rapid political changes that went in the, the country um, as it changed to a communist country. And, the, um, and it follows, it's really in a family epic following uh, multiple generations of one family. And the sort of family business, um, which has sustained them, uh, is a chocolate business. So there's lots of really evocative descriptions of chocolate in this novel, which make you really hungry, um, but also really enjoyable um, storytelling of the way it portrays these different family members' lives. And I just love a family epic for, you know, can see how changes in a family over a generation and people are influenced by their ancestors and and how that all works and how they all fit together i i just love it so i am very excited to go back to this novel and it must say you know it has one of the most beautiful covers on the list i mean it's just a work of art this cover from france there is serotonin by michael hollebeck uh, this is translated by sean whiteside so this novel concerns a depressed agricultural scientist um, who wants to uh, a fight for the plight of farmers in, in France, um, but it struggles to find an effective way to go about doing this. Uh, the, the novel's credited with sort of anticipating the Yellow Vest movement in, in France, um, which was a grassroots movement and series of protests uh, fighting for social justice. And uh, But the, the main characters also, um, one reviewer said, uh, sort of basically stalks uh, many different women and has many dodgy relationships with them. Um, so there's that as well. And Hollebeck, I've never read any of his novels. He's a very famous novelist and, and well-known, um, but I've always had this sense that I probably won't get on with his work. So I have to say this is probably the, the book I'm least interested in. But if you've read this novel or read his work before, um, let me know in the comments below if you think I should give him a try. From Germany, there is Till by Daniel Kelman, translated by Ross Benjamin. And I've been really looking forward to this novel. Um, it sounds really intriguing. So it's the, the story of a German uh, figure from German myth 
called Till Ullinspiegel, uh, who was a sort of trickster and performer. And it charts his journey um, traveling uh, across uh, the country of Germany and Europe, um, which has been devastated by the Thirty Years' War. And it incorporates a lot of real life historical figures into the story and his journey. Um, so it's a retelling of his myth. From Mexico, there is Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melchor, and it is translated by Sophie Hughes. Now, the translator, Sophie Hughes, uh, actually translated two novels on this list. Um, she, she translated the entirety of this novel, um, and she also co-translated one of the other publications, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I just read this novel a couple of weeks ago, and I loved it. I was... Um, was really hoping to see it on this list. So I'm, I'm so happy that it's, it's here because it's a really engaging, uh, absorbing story of uh, so a, a, a local woman in a Mexican village um, who is referred to as a witch by a lot of the locals. Um, she is found dead floating in a body of water. And it follows the story of a number of young characters who are uh, sort of associated uh, with her and were involved in the event leading up to her murder and so tells that that story through their points of view but it's very vivid storytelling um, so it's um, it's told there are these like big blocks of text I don't know if you can see that yeah um, so it um, it it um, it's basically um, it's not all one sentences but there are a lot of long sentences in this novel where it's it's following their their thoughts and um, you get so involved in their point of view um, it's very vigorous storytelling so I just found it completely absorbing and um, there's a lot of violent subject matter in this in terms of physical violence and sexual violence um, but it's it's looking at uh, I think it's sort of critiquing um, all of that that violence and and how uh, a very like misogynistic um, culture um, that 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 exists there. So um, yeah, I, I found it a completely absorbing novel. So I have high hopes for this book um, in this award this year. From Japan, there's the Memory Police by Yoko Agawa, and it's translated by Steven Snyder. Another novel which has a really beautiful, striking cover. And I've also read this novel, um, which I'd highly, highly recommend. Uh, it's the story is sort of a dystopian story about a, a young woman living on an island um, and there's an authoritarian force which uh, takes away, periodically takes away items um, from this, this village and makes them disappear. But when the items disappear, the locals' uh, memory of these items also disappear. So people actually don't remember um, that these items ever even existed. And uh, But there are some people in the local community who do remember some of these items which have gone missing and uh, they but they have to hide that fact and sort of go into hiding them themselves so it obviously has a lot of resonance with a lot of past totalitarian regimes throughout history but actually this is I think a much more philosophical novel than that um, it, where it's sort of looking at the the, um, the the nature of the human heart and memory and um, and asks sort of big questions about what are the the memories that we keep, um, which are the ones we keep, which are the ones that we choose to forget, in what way do we insert a sort of fictional understanding of our past into real memories from the past, and sort of complicated questions like that. Um, but it's not, the, the story's really absorbing um, in the sort of immediacy of the, the plight of the narrator as she's sort of struggling with, with all these issues in the totalitarian regime. So a very inventive novel, I'd really highly, highly recommend reading this if you haven't already. The second novel on the list from France is Faces on the Tip of My Tongue by Emmanuel Pagano. So I was a bit confused when initially when I saw this book on the list because I thought it was a book of short stories and it's one of those novels I think that is sort of uh, strides the border between short stories and a novel because it, it is does have self-contained stories in it, all centered in the same French village. Um, but some of the characters do cross over between the, the stories. So I think that's why it can be kind of classified as a novel. And actually, as I've talked about in the past, that's sort of my favorite novel to read because it makes it a kind of puzzle as you see how these characters' lives fit together. So I was reading one review where it described how it's really fascinating how it does that because some of the characters, you know, they're at a different age in different 
different stories. So you can see them from a different perspective in a different period of time. And uh, yeah, so that, that sounds really interesting. And I'm very happy to see um, a novel from Perini Press on this list because they're a great um, independent publisher that published really interesting novels. And you do pronounce the name of the, the press Perini. Um, there's, the, there's actually, I, I wasn't sure at first how to pronounce it, but they actually made a video on YouTube about a uh, really cute, fun video about how to pronounce the name of their publisher. So I'm very excited to, to read this novel. And it's one of the, the shortest books on the list. It's only about 128 pages. From the Netherlands, there is The Discomfort of Evening by Marike Lucas Regneveld, and it's translated by Michelle Hutchinson. So this is a debut novel, and uh, it was, it's meant to be very popular in, uh, in the Netherlands, and it's uh, just been translated into English. And uh, like I said, it'll be uh, published very soon. Uh, so the, the writer is uh, actually started as a poet and published a book of poetry, um, but this is their debut novel. And uh, the, the story sounds very curious. I think it's, it's, um, it's, so it's set on a farm and it's told from the perspective of a, a 10 year old girl um, who uh, has a very different way of perceiving the world and sort of sensory experiences and translating that into to language. So I think it's a sort of slightly experimental novel that is told in a unique way. And um, so this, this character, um, her brother dies in a tragic accident. And then to mourn her brother um, and try to invoke him back um, performs a lot of bizarre rituals. Um, so I think that sounds really intriguing. Um, so yeah, I'm very curious about this novel. This is a novel I know a lot of people are highly anticipating. I, I talked about it as one of my most anticipated novels in a video I made at the beginning of this, this year. And it is Little Eyes by Samantha Schweblin, which is translated by Megan McDowell. So this is the second novel on the list from Argentina. And uh, so, so this has a very creative story. Um, so Megan McDowell, ha um, sorry, Samantha Schweblin, um, actually also and Megan McDowell have been listed for the, the Booker Prize International before. Um, so her, her novel Fever Dream, um, which is a very intense, um, sort of surreal, dreamlike, hallucinatory, quite creepy novel um, I thought was absolutely brilliant and this novel follows along the same lines. This novel concerns a device called Kentucky which is sort of a blend of a toy and a mobile phone and a, a camera and it's it's a device which is taking the world by storm and a lot of people are using it and are able to connect with people across the the world um, but it's also has slightly sinister implications in how it does that and how it connects people. Uh, so yeah, such an intriguing story. I'm so excited to read this. And look at the cover, how uh, there are cute pandas on the cover, but then on the back there are creepy pandas. And finally on the list is from Spain. Um, it's Mac and His Problems by Enrique Villa Matas. Uh, it is translated by Margaret Jewel Costa and Sophie Hughes. So this is the second book on the list that is also translated by Sophie Hughes. Uh, so this story is, is meant to be quite playful and funny. Um, it's the story of Mac, who is a, a man over 60 years old, and he's writing a journal and a diary uh, about his, his everyday life. And he stresses that it's not a novel he's writing, it's a diary. Um, but his, his, uh, his wife sort of criticizes him for, for writing this and thinks that it's going to be another reason why he's going to get sort of depressed and melancholic and, and sort of inward looking rather than looking out. Um, but Mac is also uh, very familiar with literature and literary history. So he finds that as he's writing this diary, um, it takes on literary overtones and, uh, and elements of plot sort of enter into his story. And this is a writer that I've always meant to, to read because, yeah, his, his writing is supposed to be very playful and, and experimental. And uh, yeah, I've been very curious to read him before. So I'm quite excited. To, to read this. So those are all of the novels on the list. I'm going to have a go at lifting them all up. Here they all are in all of their full 
glory. And you know, the eighth life really stands out there uh, amongst the, the crowd as, as the longest novel. So um, let me know your thoughts on any of these books. If you've read any of them, uh, what you think about them, what which ones you're sort of rooting uh, for or might win or which you're most curious to, to read now. I think out of all of these, I mean, I'm definitely, you know, very excited about reading Samantha Shrublin's uh, novel. And uh, yeah, and want to get back to The Eighth Life very soon and, and finish reading that and like I said I think the only one I'm probably not all that interested in is serotonin uh, but like I said if you, if you had read this author and read this novel in particular and think I should give it a try let me know um, and if I have to make an early call of what I think might win um, I would probably say it would be either the eighth life or hurricane season but it's very early to call and you know I've only read two and a bit of these novels in their entirety so it's really difficult to say but if I wanted to make an early guess that's that's what I would say but yeah let me know all of your thoughts in the comments below uh, which and I'll put links in the description um, to purchase all these books if you want easy access to, to do that and uh, yeah and like I said if the two books which haven't been published yet are uh, the are the publication dates are brought forward I'll pin a comment in the top of the comments uh, saying that so uh, yeah here here is the Booker Prize season for the International Prize. Uh, like I said, the shortlist will be announced on April 2nd. And then the winner, I think, will be announced mid-May. I think it's May 19th. Uh, so we have all that to look forward to with the, the prize for this year. I'll uh, speak to you again soon and happy reading, everyone. Bye.